So now that we've covered the overview of the different parallelism frameworks that we have in Java, it's time to start talking specifically about the first one we're going to cover. And this one's called the, the fork join pool framework. And so what I'm going to do here is just kind of give you an overview of what the fork join framework does. And of course, what it does is it arranges to process tasks in parallel. So you'll see that the fork join pool is designed to provide a particular type of programming model for parallel computing. And it's meant for what's called fine grain task execution to enable what's called data parallelism. And it's parallel computing engine, the fork join pool, the thing here in the middle, is used by lots of other stuff. We'll cover some of that other stuff. We'll talk about parallel streams later. We'll talk about completable futures later. But it's also used by many other higher level programming frameworks. For example, if you use Kotlin, which is a programming language that's popular on Android, the fork join framework is used under the hood there. If you use Scala, which is another functional programming language, you'll see that the fork join framework is used there. It's also used for other types of things. So it's a very common framework used by lots of stuff. The style of programming that it supports is what's called divide and conquer parallelism. And uh, I'm very proud of my little animation here because it kind of illustrates what divide and conquer is all about. So the way design, divide and conquer works is if you want to solve a big problem, you first check to see if the problem is small enough. So if it's already small enough, then you just solve the problem directly using some kind of sequential algorithm. Otherwise, if it's not small enough, you split the problem into two independent parts, ideally equally sized. And then you fork new subtasks to solve each of the parts. And those then go off and run in parallel. And then you join all the subtasks. So you kind of wait until all the different pieces are done that are spawned off to run in parallel. And when you're finished, you get a single uh, reduced result or composed result or composite result by assembling all the various sub-results. So that's basically how fork join style <coughs> parallelism works. So here's what it looks like, actually, if you take a, <coughs> excuse me, a peek underneath the hood. You'll see that you have a data source, which, which could be a large amount of things to process. If you think back to the example we used before, where you want to search all the works of Shakespeare, right? The original, original data source could be all the works of Shakespeare. And when you fork, you then split up the data source into two chunks, maybe the first half of the works of Shakespeare followed by the second half of the works of Shakespeare. And then you keep forking. So you keep forking until you get things to a minimal size. A minimal size might end up being a single work of Shakespeare or whatever, right? So you, you keep forking until you get things to a point where they're no longer worth splitting any further. And we'll talk later about how you make that decision. But be that as it may, you end up with a bunch of kind of sub-tasks or sub-sources that you've split repeatedly. And once again, it helps if you can split things evenly, because it allows you to build a tree that's nicely balanced. And then you take all the different, um, well, so, so that's how the uh, splitting works. And so the way it works in the fork join framework is there's actually a method called fork. And after you split something up, then you go ahead and you know, fork things, and that splits them even further. So you keep splitting and splitting and forking and forking, and it kind of splits things up in a recursive way. You get to a point where you can't split things any further, and then you're done. And as I mentioned before, that might be when you have one of something, or it could be when you have k of something, where k is small enough it's not worth doing any further subdivision. The, the issue of when to stop splitting is, something that takes a little thought. It's not always obvious when you should stop splitting. The typical rule of thumb should be when it takes less time to just do the computation than it does to split things up. Sometimes that's obvious, sometimes it's not. Uh, most of the mechanisms that are available in Java collections that allow themselves to be split now, we'll talk about this later when we talk about streams, they typically will split things down to a single element. But that, that's just the way that Java collections work. You don't have to work it that way. <coughs> 
once you've got a bunch of things that are split to the point where they can't be split any further when they're sort of at their atomic minimal size, then we go ahead and solve all the problems. And notice what you do is you're, you have a bunch of subtasks, and all those subtasks get solved in parallel, even though each subtask is doing its processing sequentially. And under the hood, that's parallel processing is done by the fork join framework in conjunction with other runtime capabilities in the Java execution environment, the Java virtual machine, the operating system kernel, obviously the hardware cores, and so on and so forth. So these are all the things that are doing the processing. So everything will be running in parallel. The subtasks, which are the things that are running in parallel sequentially, can run on different cores. And it's up to the operating system kernel and the virtual machine and so on and the fork join framework to kind of figure out how to allocate the work to be done onto the core to do the work. And that process of determination where things run is inherently and intentionally non-deterministic. It's up to the implementation of the fork join pool and the operating system and the hardware and so on to do that mapping. And you have little or no control over how that works. And that's good because it lets the optimizations do their thing. If you only have one core, then you could run all the different threads in a time slice like manner on a single core. That might be a win, maybe. But um, to be honest with you, using a fork join framework or any kind of parallel computing infrastructure on top of a single core is probably not worth it. There are times when it might be worth it, especially if you have I.O. bound jobs and you've got a good operating system scheduler with direct memory access and so on and so forth. But as a general rule of thumb, these things are meant for multi-core platforms. You can use them on single core, but it's sort of overkill. And after things finish, <coughs> then we can wait for everything to complete. And this is by something called join. And we'll talk more about join. Join is used to wait for a subtask to finish. And uh, I'll explain a lot more about how wor join works. It doesn't actually work the way you think it does. You might think that join will just block and wait for things to be done. In fact, it actually collaborates in processing for reasons that will become more clear when we talk about how the fork join framework is implemented under the hood. And I'll explain that later. So join plays a role in executing subtasks, but it, logically it waits. It uh, doesn't return to the caller until the task it's waiting for is finished. Yes? Um, it's when you call join, you call join on a particular subtask. And it turns out, because of the way it's implemented under the hood, it can also wait for other things to happen as well. But, but it won't return until the subtask it's waiting on has finished. So the fact that other subtasks may also have finished is sort of an implementation detail. But um, it doesn't have to wait for all the subtasks to finish. It just has to wait till its subtask is finished. But it may also, sort of under the hood, wait for other subtasks too. Um, depending on the order in which they finish. And we'll talk a bit more about that when we talk about how the fork join framework behaves internally. And then what happens is as the joins finish, the results are combined together and merged until you end up with a single result. So you basically have sort of a, you create a tree of tasks by forking, <laughs> and then you have a bunch of joins that pull everything together at the end. All right, so, and the point of all this, as, as you probably have guessed, is we want to start out with a big thing, and we want to split it up and do small things. We want to run those small things in parallel. We want to join all the results together and end up with a single joined result when all is said and done. So that's basically how the whole thing works. Now, uh, I've been kind of implying here that a task is returning a result, and that join is waiting for the results of the sub-results to finish. If that, in fact, is not correct, if, if there is not actually a um, result that's being returned by a subtask, then there's no reason for it to return a result. It just waits for it to be finished. And you'll see that when we talk about something called a recursive action later. It's actually a 
particular type of fork join task that doesn't have a return value. So it, it just is used as a synchronizer, not as a, re a value returner. OK, so that's a quick overview of the fork join pool, just in terms of logically what it's doing. 